I'd like to continue my burden that I started uh, two nights ago. Uh, I feel that word was good and I trust it was helpful, but I feel there's still more burden within me to clarify and maybe even make more practical. Um, and I will surely say something more on the positive side, so to speak. Um, remember, we establish a few things from the outset uh, as we began to wade into this whole matter of what should be the stance or uh, the standing and the attitude uh, of the Christian and of the Christian church, the church of God, towards all the things in the world. And in particular, uh, things such as politics, such as the society with all all the problems that they um, entail. And of course, just take a look around us these days. Uh, what you see is just this um, 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 uproar. May I use that word? This commotion, this convulsion, uh, this um, tumult, this uh, great uh, pandemonium of things happening around us, whether it is triggered by the health crisis in a way, um, but uh, all the things that are just uh, laying laying there already uh, for for decades, for, for many, many years, are now just all uh, letting loose. Uh, the all kinds of social problems, civil uh, unrest, the um, um, uh, um, racial unrest, um, um, the um, um, and all all these things. Of course, I am not even talking about the economic universe, uh, the economy, the. Uh, the, the world of finance, the world of, world of commerce, and, and all these things. And, of course, uh, I mentioned politics already. All these um, uh, major things, are, they are all of, of the human civilization or human government are all intertwined. So when one thing's happened, it, it has a domino effect, and, and we're seeing it right in front of our eyes. With these myriads of problems and that begs the question, um, um, who will solve this? Or um, with all these kind of problems, um, uh, how will it be solved? When will we be solved? Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, then we come back to the, the church um, uh, people. What should we do about it or not? What should our attitude be? Should we be engaged? Should we be disengaged? all these kind of questions. So, um, uh, however, that being the case, we establish a few points that has, we, we have to stand on that that will give us the basis to have the kind of uh, discussion or discourse that we will have in this very, very vital matter. My burden is, uh, of course, particularly with the young generation. Millennials are kind of old already, right? The young millennials and Generation Z, the next generation, those who are in college, even in high school, I'm deeply burdened for them. But it is not just for the young ones. I think the older generation, middle age and beyond, even my age, uh, we would do well to have a refresher course, if you will, on this very matter that we may uh, be taking for granted, uh, but actually we're not so much uh, knowledgeable or we are not so deep in the truth of the matter. So we're standing a bit on sand or on thin ice um, 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 when it comes to having to deliberate or having to, you know, articulate just exactly what the scripture says, just exactly does the Bible says. In other words, what is the truth of the matter? When I say truth, I mean the divine reality, the truth that is revealed in the word of God. So we establish firstly that 
our discussion here, our fellowship here, is based on only one thing, and that is the Word of God. That is primary. That is a cardinal principle. We, they are philosophers. They are umpteen writers. They are throughout the ages and social reformers, politicians, statesmen, and all kinds of people with all manners of opinion, even today. All you need is just to turn on your device, and somebody's talking about this. Many experts, many um, uh, intellectual people, um, people with great uh, worldly achievements, smart and uh, people, they have all kinds of things. They offer solutions. They, they try to give their kind of analysis and assessment. And not only so, there are a lot of good people people who have a good intention with with a heart to really uh, solve the problem, um, the, the so-called systemic problem in society, whether it's racism or whether it is um, uh, 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 something else. And, um, uh, uh, um, uh, um, you know, inequality, the matter of... Um, of uh, uh, the deprivation of certain rights of a certain segment of society and and the unfairness of things and the uh, the leveling the playing field, the problems with the whole uh, law and order community, the police um, and and the government even you know and uh, um, all kinds of things i 'm talking about the USA of course here, and so um, and a lot of well-intentioned people, they, they study this matter, they write, you know, they have think tanks, they just do nothing but churn out papers on these things. Hopefully the legislators, the White House or whatever people in power of influence can make use of those data and, and, and change things for the better. And as a human being, I applaud that. I'm not against that. But what are we doing here? We are here in another realm, brothers and sisters, we're in another realm. We are, this is the second thing that we establish. We're in a realm that includes God. We're in a spiritual realm. We're in an unseen realm. We're in an invisible realm of God, where God is. And so we call it, you know, especially for us the believers, a divine and mystical realm, a, a realm of mystery. That's where we both belong, a heavenly realm, right? And we are, and in this realm, it is the kingdom of God, meaning this is the realm of God. This is God's realm that we're talking about. That's the church. And that's, we exist. Am I right? Spiritually speaking. And, so uh, we're 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 not of you know the Lord says clearly to to Pontius Pilate the, the 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 my kingdom is not of this world my kingdom is not of this world if if it were I won't be arrested you know um, you know um, no my kingdom is not of this world my kingdom is of another world or another realm or another universe. And that universe or that realm is simply God himself, the realm of God, the divine realm. Unless we would be unsaved, unless we reject the faith, unless we uh, stop believing in the Lord and in the Bible, we are in this realm. Because this is the topic. The church is in this realm. Am I right? The church does not exist in the realm of the earth, the church is heavenly. The, the, the church is, uh, is godly. The church is in God. This is the church of God. The, ch the church is the church of Christ. That means it's one with Christ. You cannot talk about the church without God and Christ and the spirit involved. Of course, what we have in front of us after 2,000 years due to the deterioration and degradation of the church of God everything has changed. The church has deformed. The church has changed its nature. All right? And so what the little mustard seed has now become this great big tree with all manners of evil birds on it. This fine flower today has become leaven to become one big lump in Matthew 13. That means it has transmuted into something of a different kind, different nature. The so-called church of God today actually is not the church of God. It is Christendom. 
It is something of God, something of the Bible that is mingled and mixed with a lot of the world, including politics, including uh, social things, including all the human things on the earth today. So all the church, many churches are active in in a lot of these things to try to contribute to the uh, the, the solution of human problems in society. They actively engage in politics. They even become activists of some sort uh, to 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 uh, change the environment, to 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 save the planet, and and to save mankind, and so on and so forth. I think you know what I'm talking about. But does that should is the church there? The church does not belong there because Christ is not there. And of course, we we also establish that not only the church is uh, in this realm. Of course, we as believers, individually, singly, we are also in this realm. We are people who have received the life of God. We are children of God with God's life. With God is our God being our Father. We we are believers. We have the we are the ones who have believed into Christ. That means we have we are mingled with Christ. We join with Christ. We have received the last Adam, the life giving Spirit. Am I right? So we have a mingled spirit. So we we are we are also His kingdom folks, the kingdom kingdom people. We belong to the kingdom of the heavens, not of this earth. Yes, I am a U.S. citizen. I hold a U.S. passport. But my real citizenship is in the heavens. I am but a sojourner, a passerby of this earth today, according to Hebrews. I hope these things we should know is in the Bible, but we need to reassert them. We need to reaffirm them. We need to say, amen, that's who I am. If we don't do this, we are liable to be shaken, to be distracted, and to misaim. You know, there's this verse in Timothy that talks about those people who, uh, concerning the truth, have misaimed. And and they, of course, they say some heresy, you know, that uh, uh, resurrection is over or there's no such thing. In that kind of a saying, they they have misaimed. They, They let the church off the mark. And my burden in these talks, brothers and sisters, is to keep us on the mark. This is my burden. Otherwise, the church will be off to a different pathway. We're just barking up the wrong tree. We're going after things that the church is not supposed to get into. And we as Christians are engaged or involved and participate in in things that we should not be engaged in. Now, I also established this. All this does not mean we don't care. See, this is a different thing. Like we are just turning our eye, blind eye to what is going on and all the human sufferings and affliction and inequality and injustice. Uh, we are apathetic. We're indifferent. We have no compassion in our heart. Uh, we care less. No, I say a strong no. At least I will tell you that. No, I care. I watch, I observe. When someone is murdered, uh, that's horrific. That is terrible. And that ought to be condemned. And it ought to be the person, the um, 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 uh, perpetrator ought to be um, uh, prosecuted to the full extent of the law. This is a law and order society within. And as a member of this society under in subjection to the present-day human government that I find myself in, I have to live according to those laws as a human being. And also as a human being, not to mention even I'm a Christian today, with God's love in me, the love of God, the love for for the world, uh, with with Christ, his virtuous, um, uh, his virtues, his burden for mankind. You know, when he first time, when he came to this earth, he 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 saw um, 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 a, a child who died and the mother there, and and he says he was filled with compassion. He was filled with uh, sorrow, and then he actually went and uh, raised the dead. And in many cases, he was the good Samaritan. Am I right? No one cared for this uh, 
uh, this uh, this person laying there wounded and broken, but he came along and healed him and took care of him. That is the Lord Jesus. And this Lord Jesus is in us today, brothers and sisters, and we ought to have a compassionate heart. We ought to have feeling when there's suffering um, um, among human beings. So we are not unfeeling. We are not empathetic. So I like to establish that too. Today we talk about the black people, the African-American people. My heart goes out to them. They have been wrong. They have been, you know, um, um, uh, disenfranchised. Now I'm not, I, I better be careful. Otherwise I wade into some political or, 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 or the, 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 some kind of a, a, a um, discussion there. That is not my point. My point is just, um, they matter to us. They matter to us. However, that all that said, all that said, we also establish another fact, and that is God knows. Not only we see, observe, even God knows. Do, do not think that God uh, is uh, indifferent to the evils of society, into, uh, indifferent to the, uh, uh, the, the um, um, unrighteous systems or social systems or political systems or economic systems in our society. Um, no, no. But we establish also that these problems, huge deep-seated problems, are beyond the our ability individually or collectively to really solve these are these are problems that um, of, of, of this human society they are not unsolvable except by God himself and not only so not only he is the one who had the ability have the ability to solve them he has a plan to solve them I like to tell you brothers and sisters it's not like God is just like this and he's playing chess or something like this. He doesn't know what he's doing. And then whatever comes to his mind, whatever um, 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 uh, he feels like doing, he does. No, God is a purposeful God. He has a plan in place. From the time when he created the humankind after himself, uh, God had a plan. God had a plan for man. God had a plan for this earth. And even after man fell, being poisoned by Satan, being injected with sin to become evil, to become the flesh, and become in rebellion towards God, to God's, God's dominion, God still had a plan. He never changed his plan. But he also had a contingency plan, if I may use that word, and that is the plan for man's salvation. And that salvation is, number one, to have a way to bring man back to himself because man has transgressed his righteousness. Man has violated his holiness. Man has become just basically satanic, become God's enemy. So God has a plan to re reconcile man back to himself, to make man right with himself. He had a plan for that. In fact, that's why Jesus came for the first time, am I right? To execute and carry out that plan to bring man back to himself. But that plan of salvation does not stop merely with judicial redemption. That plan involves something, includes something we call organic salvation. That means not only to clean the man up, to forgive his sins, to make him right in position. But even listen to this. This is the power of God. This is the great salvation, the salvation to the uttermost. And that is he would want to save man from within, to save man from his fallen human being, to save man in his tripartite being, spirit and soul and body, in fact, he is doing something to save man from his fallen human nature, to give him a new nature by giving him a new life. And that would be his own life and his own nature. 
And this process is called renewal. This process is called sanctification. This process is called transformation. And eventually this fact, this, this process is called confirmation and glorification. So that today he is not only regenerated as sons, but he is going to grow in us. He's going to gain us. He's going to possess us. He is going to add himself to us all these things of God's economy that we all should know so that he will bring many sons into glory, that we will be conformed to the image of Christ. And by this way, we would become, we sons of the devil, we sons of disobedience, will be what? Will become like Christ. We'll, Christ-like, we will become God light, we will even become God in life and nature. My, and with this, we will possess all of God's glorious attributes. We will possess all of Christ's aromic virtues. We will possess all the divine riches. We would possess all the, um, the, um, the, the human virtues. And with this, with this, I'll tell you, as a kingdom person, that kingdom with Christ as the king, with God as the realm, would, wouldn't you believe that kingdom will be filled with righteousness? That kingdom will be filled with justice. That kingdom will be filled with equality. That kingdom will, will be filled with uh, beauty and harmony. Uh, that all the things that the human being long for in his being created by God, that can, that will happen. That is going to happen, I will tell you for sure. It is prophesied in the Bible in the Old Testament, even by the prophets. I mentioned Isaiah for one, Daniel for another, who would even prophesy concerning the coming kingdom of Christ where everything will be made right. All the problem will be solved. Social problems, political problems, everything. And brothers and sisters, this is what we should be looking for. And today, today what is happening with the Christians, with the Christian church, this is what we should aim at and not misaim. This is called God's sovereign and divine economy. To work himself into man. To make man just like him. So that they would all be children of the kingdom of the heavens. You just contrast. I I give you a little contrast just to show you how impossible it is for fallen human beings to right this ship. to, To fix the world's problem. Now, these are the kind of people, would you trust these people who will fix the world's problems? Okay, now this is the Apostle Paul. He's pretty blunt. He's straightforward. I just am quoting from Romans chapter 1 about the condemned world, and this is his description about the, the, the generally the unbelieving world today being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, covetousness, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malignity, whisperers, slanderers, hateful to God, insolent, arrogant, boasters, inventor of evil things, disobedient to parents, senseless, faithless, affectionless, merciless. Do you think these people can bring in utopia? Really? Do you think these people, I don't care where there would be a, a deep down, a, 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 a some good and some intention there to be good, according to the law of the mind, so to speak. Do you think so? Whatever systems, political systems, I don't care if it's democracy or socialist, socialism or communism, I, I don't care what it is. It's not the systems. It's not the ideals it's not the, 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 these noble ideologies. It is who is doing this, who is legislating the law, who is running, administrating these governments, who is really running the show. It is these people, the fallen human being. 
So the only solution, brothers and sisters, the only solution is the Lord coming again. In the first coming, he solved the spiritual problem of mankind. He did not touch. He refused to touch anything of human politics, anything of the human government, anything of the social ills, anything in of the social systems, including this wicked evil system called slavery, which is prevailing in the Roman Empire. Terrible, terrible system. He didn't do anything. He came rather to live a life under God and in subjection even to the human government at that time. Render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. And he just lived that life He lived as a God-man, as a kingdom, a person in the kingdom. All these things in, in uh, Matthew chapter 5 that talks about blessed is this kind of person and blessed is that kind of person. The, the meek, those who are hunger for, hungry for righteousness and, and, and um, those who are being reproached and, and uh, those who are the peacemakers, those who are um, 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 poor in spirit, those who are pure in heart. All these is lived out by this God man. I tell you, therefore, with him is the kingdom of God. That's the kingdom of God in a man. And this man went through death to die for our redemption and our salvation. As a seed, he was sown into the ground. And in resurrection, he became the life-giving spirit to germinate, to regenerate us with his life, the life, the divine eternal life. And by that, he put into us, he dispensed into us his, his divine nature. All that he, the way he lived, all that he would live successfully. And there is in one man, perfect justice, perfect righteousness, perfect everything. That's how the world should be. That's how human society should be. That's what we aspire to today, human beings. So the only way, and then he resurrected to become the spirit, to come into us, and he ascended up on high to the heavens to to now carry out his heavenly ministry for these last 2,000 years in this invisible, hidden, divine and mystical realm. To what? Continue to save man through the church, to continue to redeem man, to continue to um, 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 uh, sanctify man from within, to continue to transform man. By this way, he reproduced this kingdom. And so today, brothers and sisters, the genuine Christians, we should be a kingdom of God. In fact, the apostle says that. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. In this kingdom, it is utopia, if you you, borrow that word for a moment. This is what human race actually aspire to. Now, uh, I'm uh, spending too much time maybe on this matter, But brothers and sisters, you can see I still have a burden that uh, this matter is gotten through, uh, especially with the younger generation who are who are among us. I'm especially burdened for you. You have received a lot of kind of uh, input and and teaching and and uh, may I use the word indoctrination of many many things from the human viewpoint. Maybe from a good place to try to solve problems, to right the problems. But all these things, listen, are worldly philosophies. These things are worldly ideologies. Good or bad, right or wrong, let us put aside that value judgment here. But I am saying those things are not what works eventually. The many people who have done that, young people, idealistic they want to bring in a just 
earth and so on and so forth, but they end up disillusioned. They find out pretty soon politics is totally corrupt, totally evil, dark, full of hypocrisy, whole full of unrighteousness. You try to use politics as a way to solve problems. I tell you, that is what happened and that is what going to happen and what is happening right now. Even in so many other kind of social causes and this and that, I tell you, as long as the human nature is unchanged, there will be no real solution. God not only have a solution, as I begin to mention, he has another step to take. That step is his the second coming of his firstborn son. First time he came, the only begotten son. And then it says, your throne, O God. Uh, not, not your throne, O God. Yes, it, it says what? Um, um, you are my son. This day have I begotten you in resurrection. Not only he was begotten, we were begotten in him, in his resurrection. So today, we're the many begotten like him with his life. And he's been, we pray, he's been growing in us. He is um, uh, gaining us. He is sanctifying our whole being. He's perfecting us. He's even maturing in us. And by all these things, he's even building us up together. And today, we should, even before he comes, we should have a corporate expression of the kingdom. The corporate expression of the one new man. By the way, in the one new man, there is no this or that. No difference in ethnicity. No difference in social class. No difference of free men or slaves. There is no room for that. In this one new man, there's only room for Christ. Now, granted, today we're in the process. We're not perfected yet. There's still problems among us, even among Christians. I would admit that. I would admit that. We're not perfect at all. But dear brothers and sisters, we're in the right place, and we're on our way. And what else is the Lord doing today? The Lord is not, today is doing something even more particular than that. Today, the Lord is producing his overcomers in the right environment of the church life. You know, by the way, young brothers and sisters, I'll tell you, never have the thought of leaving the church. The church is not perfect. But the church is God's dwelling place in practice. This is the place where we're protected. This is a place we can be guarded and safe from all the worldly influences and assaults and things that will pull us, distract us into the worldly things and the worldly ways. My heart was broken when I heard that in the Instagram and Facebook and this and that. Our own young brothers and sisters, some are getting into that. They're swept into that dialogue, that conversation, that discussion, even those kind of activities. I'm not saying they are bad. That's bad because they are bad people. I'm not saying that. I'm saying there is a distraction. There is a blurring of vision of who we are and what we are and what the church is and what role the church should play related to God's purpose on this earth, which ultimately will what will be establishing his kingdom, a just and righteous kingdom on the earth. That is the way. God's economy is the unique way for all this to happen. Today, in the church life, we have a marvelous environment. Just like I mentioned Noah, you know, it says in the days of Noah, 
So the days of the Son of Man will be. That means the time, the 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 day when the Lord is coming. That is the day of the Son of Man. The day of the Lord, the day of God. We're close to that day, the end days before the Lord would come in His parousia to establish His kingdom. At that time, the situation on the earth is just like now. Or now is just like then. People are given to marrying, eating, drinking, and all this that are seemingly all very, very uh, things for human existence, things that are legitimate. But all those things, they are just what taken into that. They are filled with. Uh, they are just living for themselves, with no heart for God and forgetting everything about their. Longer-term destiny, even their eternal destiny, and and suddenly the 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 um, the flood came, right? But you have one person who is a righteous man who walked with God. That is Noah. What did he do? He didn't go out there to protest. He didn't reform the government. Uh, you know, he didn't go out and try to stop the violence. I don't know. I'm just saying the Bible never tells us, but the Bible very clearly tells us what he did according to God's commandment. He said, "Build an ark, something that never existed on this earth. Something when he built, even he didn't know what this thing is for. Just he just used the wood, used the pitch, used this and that. Build it in this way. It's an ark, something that floats." And he found grace in the eyes of God, and for hundreds of years he built that. He built that. He built that. He must be really scorned and ridiculed and derided by these fellow men. What is this crazy man doing? Why isn't he enjoying himself? Why isn't he, he, he he's why is he not living like a normal human being? What is he doing? He is building this strange. Vessel, this strange thing. Little do men know he was building something that will save him from God's judgment. And number two, something that will separate him from this perverse and doomed generation. And number three, something that will give him passage, passage. From this corrupt age, world filled with violence and lust and lawlessness, into a new world, a new age. All that is a type of the coming kingdom. Brothers and sisters, what are we doing today? What should we be concentrated on? What should be our focus as saints? We should be focused on building the ark for our own salvation and the salvation of of ours, meaning all those who are should be part of God's family. Noah had altogether eight souls; all were saved. Today, we're building an ark for our own salvation, work on, working out our own salvation. But not only so, to bring as many men as we can, those who are chosen, predestined by God, to save them into this ark. What is this ark? This ark is Christ. This ark is also the church, the enlargement of Christ, the corporate Christ, and this is what we're building in the church life. Today, and so here we are in the church life for for this. Now, I come to this point. You know, today I offer you another hymn, another hymn. So I give you another assignment. I don't know whether you enjoy the first hymn, right? Jesus, our King, Jesus, our King, and Mark particularly point out stanza two, right, about the coming kingdom. What we will look like, and 
I introduced, to, I, I offered to you 147, a hymn actually by Brother Witness Lee, Brother Witness Lee, and I hope that you can sing it this week or, or these coming days. Um, and see what we are talking about here. This is talking about the coming kingdom, the coming kingdom. Today, I spent an afternoon reading Psalm 2. Psalm 2, which is a, my goodness, what a psalm that is. A whole psalm about Christ. Turning, turning the sentiment of the people from the law. Right? That's in Psalm 1. To to Christ. I'm not going to talk about that. I just want to say how marvelous that psalm is. The first few verses about the nations in an uproar, the, 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 the uh, what it says here, you know, uh, and uh, people contemplating a, a vain thing, the kings of this earth. This is just talking about the human government, a godless human civilization and government. In fact, they are so anti-God, they counsel together to what? To be against God's anointed, and that is Christ. And then the second part, a few verses, is about God's proclamation about, about Christ. It says, he who sits in the heaven shall laugh. I kind of like that. You know, we are here scared and all the things going on. People are throwing out big words. People are doing these things and that thing, thinking they know what they're doing and they have the solution. He who sits in the heaven will laugh. The Lord will have them in derision. And he said, he, he said, I will speak to them in anger, you know, from laughing to anger. That's quite a change of emotion on the part of God, and he said, I have installed my king upon Zion. You do what you want to do. You elect who you want to elect. I have already, I will set my, I have already installed my king, my selected king upon Mount Zion. This is God speaking. And then we, Christ come in and speak about what? You are my son. Today I have begotten you. I I will give you nations for your inheritance, the limits of the earth as your possession. Brothers and sisters, all the nations are Christ's inheritance, and the all the earth, the entire earth, is his possession. And he will break them or rule them with the iron rod one day. You can read Revelation and see that see that fulfilled in prophecy. And then finally, finally, there is this word of a kind of um, uh, warning, if you will, um, that now let's be prudent. Let's take the admonition. Let's serve Jehovah with fear. And let's kiss the son. Kiss the son so that he won't be angry and we perish. And in the end, blessed are those who take refuge in him. I, I just, because I've been reading and telling you this, brothers and sisters, what a picture. What a picture here. This is the truth. This is what is happening. And this is what will happen. My burden, my burden, dear saints, is that we see this. And if we don't see this, we will be tossed. Is in Ephesians 4? Like... Uh, like uh, little children. Actually, Greek means infants, babies, babies, tossed to and fro like this by all the systems of error, by all the teachings, and, and by the slight of uh, man, and so on. By you be deceived. The word sounds good. The word sounds noble. The, the word sounds great. The cause seem to be really worthy. And it attracts so many young people. But I would like to tell you, young brothers and sisters, come back to the word of God. Know the truth. And even 
what I'm speaking, I hope, would open a kind of a vista or kind of a way in to study the truth. These two pillars of the Lord's two comings. Two pillars. Two pillars here. Right? That is somewhat holding up the timeline of God's economy. God's purpose. The first time to save Accomplish redemption to save and regenerate man. The second time to come to this earth as the king. To smite the nations. To judge the human. To end the human government. To clear up this whole unrighteous earth of all the things. And to establish his own kingdom. And in this kingdom, those who are righteous will shine as the son. Who are these? These are those who were with him. These are the believers who live the life that God had intended them to live by virtue of his being in them. These are the ones who are the overcomers against the backdrop of a failed church, of a church that failed to live up to God's standard, God's requirement. This is a church that has failed in her function, her role of what she should be. This is a church that has failed in her commission. And a church that had been actually mixed up, married to the world in so many ways. Brothers and sisters, um, I don't know where I am, but I will tell you, I'm looking forward to the king to come. You know, many dread the end. They dread the end times, the judgment day. Brothers and sisters, I am looking forward to it. I pray for that. I sing these hymns, come Lord Jesus, king, coming king. You know, I, we, we, we seldom even use this term that he is the coming king. He's not only the savior who came, he is the coming king. And that's our hope. That's our future. And that is what will happen to this earth where everything will be made right. Well, I think this may be good enough. Um, So saints, let us build the ark. Let us build up the church life um, and our Christian life an overcoming life in the church. Let us every day come to the throne of grace to find grace like like Noah and receive mercy for all of our needs, the dispensing of grace into us to empower us, to supply us to do what we cannot do and live the way we cannot live. This grace we can find today. Let us allow the Lord's life to grow within us, to expand in us, to even mature in us. Let us be built up together as his body, his living body. And let us function as his priests, as his people, to build up, to edify the saints and to build up the church and we must not forget, we must here be here to proclaim the good tidings, to suffer with the gospel so that many who are not yet saved will be saved. This is the church great commission. Let us also live a life under the kingdom, right? With this kingdom life today under his authority under his headship, under his throne. All these things I think you'd know. 
This is what we should be doing today in the church life. Oh, glorious church life. And in this church life, I pray many brothers and sisters will overcome. And they will be here to even prepare the bride, to beautify, to adorn the bride, so that Christ can come as the bridegroom to receive her. At the same time, we'll be here perfected, trained, and equipped to be his army, his fighting army with the whole armor of God, right? Actually, the bride and the army actually are the same group of people. They wear the same white linen, bright and pure. But they both satisfy the Lord, and they also would defeat the enemy with the Lord, the Antichrist, with all the nations. Do you know the overcomers will be part of that army that will destroy and deal with all the nations of the earth? And when that happens, the kingdom of this earth will become the kingdom of our Lord and of the Christ, the Messiah. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I I feel so happy, so, so um, clear. I feel so, um, uh, we know what we should do. We know what we should do. So as we're looking around, looking around, we should pray for this country. We should pray for the people in this country. We should pray for the running of the white horse, am I right, of the gospel. We should ourselves be the salt of the earth, the light of the world. And the church should be that city on a hill, on a hill as a testimony of what can be if what? If God is working out his economy, his salvation in a group of people. Amen. And that would be the great influence to the world. Amen. Amen. I stop there. Mark, back to you. Amen.